Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and books. And today, I am joined by my good friend, Dr. Philip Chase. Hello. Hello, Hello everyone. <laughs> um, and today, <laughs> Philip and I are going to be talking, uh, spoiler talk, uh, about book four of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, House of Chains. Hello. Um, the spoiler-free talk that we did uh, where Philip and I were just sitting chatting away, that is on his channel. I will link to it in the description below. Um, if you don't want spoilers, I recommend that you go there because this is going to be spoilers for House of Chains and potentially for all the books preceding it. So uh, Gardens of the Moon, Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice. So that being said, Philip, really good to see you. Let's talk spoilers like, uh, about uh, House of Chains. Yeah, I, I, every time we do the non-spoiler, I feel like we're just kind of itching to get into those spoilers. So we are here finally. So well, yeah, I'm excited to talk about Carsa. I'm excited to talk about all these duos in here that are so wonderful, particularly that one you were talking about. That's going to be interesting. Uh, where do you want to start? Well, wait, um, let's, let's do a beginning is a good place to start. Right. So let's what we referred to in the in the non spoiler version about this structural thing. Yes. Um, I think this is a good place to start because obviously the first quarter of the book essentially is a novella. Well, novel, if you're in any other genre, but a novella in fantasy. Right. right. Um, following Carsa from his very secluded, insular tribal community that is right. completely cut off from the rest of the world that yep. Uh, they, they don't take anything from there. Very isolated. And we follow this position as he goes down, uh, following the tradition of what his grandfather has, has mm. told him is the correct way to do things. And right. there are these tribal rules about how to behave. And he is the most arrogant, yeah. annoying, shithead of a person. <laughs> Like, yes, he is. He is absolutely loathsome. I, you just love this character because he is so well realized. You're looking at him going, you arrogant. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Like he is so alive on the page. And you can see these connections to Conan, to King Cull, to yeah. all of these pulp stories. Yeah. And because it's that kind of novella length, that point of connection to those earlier Robert E. Hard and, and uh, uh, William Burroughs, like Tarzan, that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. And he goes from this community with his two mates who quite clearly loathe him because yeah. let's face it, who wouldn't? Um, and they go on this adventure. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, they're all, they're all parochial, but it seems to me that Carsa is especially so. And his friend Baroth, is the one who really is a much more clever, you know, individual who he also participates in some horrible things. Just let's go kill some children, you know, that uh, I'm not really sure what they, what's the, that? The, the very first time I read this. Yeah. Um, I was going, children? Yeah. What, what the hell? Yeah. You sick bastard, Erickson. What? <laughs> and then suddenly, when he gets down right. to the city, I'm like, oh, he's a giant. Oh. They're all tiny because right. I had completely missed that earlier on. We're told he's 80. Right, right. He's and they're, they're big. Old. Right. And the rest of us Flatlanders or whatever they call us, we're, we're normal sized and they're huge. So we're children. So not yeah. only, but not only is he 80 and huge, right. so we're right. tiny compared to him. We're the size of children to him. But if you yeah. think our age, our life cycle, we, yeah. we never grow up. Right. We die as teenagers to them. So yeah. yes, of course they would think of us as children. Children, yeah. Um, I, ho I hope I'm a little wiser than that when I'm 80 though. I mean, he does some terrible things along the way. We discussed, we alluded to the fact that there are some difficult um, moments in here. There's, there's, he does some rape, some, um, people along the way. He uh, kills a whole lot of people without really any very uh, convincing reason. But one of the, but, one of the, I think one of the interesting things is, do you remember the scene where they get to the other Tibor village? Yes, where he, he, he yes, yeah. And 
he goes, right, well, we can either drink our blood oil or you can do And all of the women go, yeah, okay. Because in their culture, this is the right. practice. Right. And like reading that as a modern reader and you're going, how do I wrap my head around the fact yeah. that these people believe this is the right thing to do? It's interesting too, because that's the female perspective there. And Carsa initially is surprised because he's like, aren't you going to struggle? Aren't you going to? And then she's the, the, the chieftain's wife, or I, I can't remember her name, if she's even named, but she said, oh, you thought that your women would, oh, okay. And so you see one layer of his, his naive nature being chopped away right there. I mean, he's going to go through a lot more, but that's an I interesting moment. And it is because it's absolutely because he's been so convinced this is what's going to happen. And right. then you realize that, no, all of the stories he's been told are lies. This is the first major crack in his right. entire worldview. And right. this is what we follow, the, the, this entire novel. So the novella at the start, and then obviously what happens to the end. This is his transition where yep. his world is absolutely shattered. But yep. in that moment, what I loved about that is that these women go, oh yeah, because the men have to say that because that's the lie they all tell each other. We right. women know the truth. And why would we fight you? We'd all end up in the same place anyway. And then and, and this, this has been going on for centuries. This is how our tribes function. And then we find out that this has been deliberately structured that way to improve the genetic breeding that right. this is a Bene Gesserit level sort of yeah. breeding program because right. only the strongest warriors would be able to impregnate women and therefore we would have stronger and stronger warriors. You go, yeah. the level of malevolence in structuring a society that way is absolutely astounding. And it is revealed slowly over time that these things are, are given to us and you go, oh my god that this isn't just about carsa being a bad person right this is about how a society can be structured to believe that this is good like the grandfather look at what happens the same woman i believe in that case i know it happens a couple of times where carsa thinks oh my grandfather was this great warrior who went through and slaughtered everyone and there was blood in his wake and Oh, and she's like, oh, that guy? Yeah, we, you know, we fed him and, and we took care of him. We gave him a pat on the head and sent him on his way. And he was, what? No, 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 no. That's not the narrative, right? So it, he, it happens to him again when he finally reaches Silver Lake. He realizes that his grandfather was kind of full of it. Uh, but not only that, I loved in, in his grandfather's storytelling. Yes, there's yeah. this farmstead and there's this. So of right. course, this is just his grandfather's time and Cars is going, well, there might be a couple of, a couple more houses here. Okay, lads, let's go. And they come charging out and there's a town with a wall. And it's like. <laughs> yeah, and it, I think and, it's Baroth, right? Who says, uh, Carsa, how many <laughs> generations of these children have gone by since your grandfather was here? And Carsa says, yeah, quite a few, what of it? You know, it's. And, and, and that because Ericsson plays with that tight focus on Carsa at the beginning. Yeah. That's it. Like we're assuming he's human. We're assuming he is some sort of barbarian living in this tribe. And so Ericsson, his essay, The, the Problem with Carsa Orlog, absolutely brilliant essay where he's talking all about um, the different aspects of how uh, we, you have the noble savage and then you have the barbarian these different stereotypes being applied that right. as an anthropologist um he'd looked at that and it always sat uh, uneasily with him when he was reading these stories right. and this was his chance to explore it to play with it to deconstruct it to to move yeah. it around yeah and in those moments when we go from initially kind of identifying with Carsa and his society and thinking, yeah. oh yeah, so it's a tribal society and a fantasy world. Oh, we're all fine. You're going to kill children. That's, that's the first point where I'm, mm -hmm. and then <laughs> the whole, the whole rape thing. And you're like, but is it rape if all of the women in the society genuinely consent? Hmm. 
because they view it as part of well yes this is this is how things work you right. won the battle right this is what happens and it suddenly raises these questions about mm -hmm. moral relativism about issues of consent and it makes us think about them and yeah. we see carso then this is his norm and yet we know his norm is a lie because right. Erickson keeps feeding us this information to show us this is not right. This yep. is a lie. This is disingenuous. This is not the truth. And right. every aspect of his journey reveals more and more of this. Right. He shows that Carsa is arrogant. He shows that he's ignorant. He shows that their entire society is uh, constructed on these lies that right. they accept terrible behavior because they have been lied to and they are victims. They have been manipulated. And it again is asking us, not telling us, but right. asking us, try and think about it from outside of our own perspective. Yes. Um, and it you really... know, some, some people will find this incredibly difficult and I don't blame them. Like the, these are yeah. difficult topics. Like ethically, these are complex issues. And Erickson goes, yeah, these are complex issues. This right. is our chance to explore them in a safe way, in a way yeah. that is distant from the real. It connects yeah, to the real. It's connected to these ethical issues. Yep. But let's explore it in a way where we, we don't feel threatened, where we yeah. can actually look at the issues and weigh things. Yeah. It, it, it's a wonderful aspect of fantasy and science fiction that we can take really yeah. serious problems, really serious societal issues, and put them at a safe different distance with a lens that allows us to start thinking about them. Yep. They, these books really do defy knee-jerk moral judgment in, on, in many ways. And I really enjoy them for that, that they provoke such thought and the the fact that you have a character who initially i do not like this guy carsa at all i do not like him but it, when he starts interacting with torvald nam that there are some moments there where it's like he's being taught he's having his eyes opened and he realizes something that he did not previously he forms a relationship with torvald and that changes carsa it, it really opens his eye or begins to to show him a different world. And I, I can't help myself, but I start understanding this character that I previously really did not want to like. And, and again, this is, this is one of the things that, you know, we keep saying this series is about compassion. This series yeah. is about empathy. This series yeah. is about understanding. Mm -hmm. And we say this and people nod, and then they go, yeah, but you know, he's, he's a bad character. You're like, but this is what it is. It's showing us a bad character because we right. can judge Carsa and go, he is bad. He does bad things. Right. right. Now, try and understand his perspective. You right. do not, under any circumstance, have to agree with Carsa. You don't have to think he is good, but try and understand his perspective. Because right. what we see happen to Carsa is Carsa starts to try to understand other people's perspective exactly and we see this transition we see him questioning his own social constructs his own bias his own limited way of thinking his yeah. own learned responses to things like carsa is effectively carsa smash until yeah. he realizes you know look at the number of times he makes vows of vengeance and i vow to do that and right. what does he do at the end? I'm not making those vows anymore. More it's vows. Yeah. Because simplistic answers are rarely the solution. Right. Issues tend to be far more complex. But even then, Erickson throws in a, a spanner in the works. Because how does Carsa deal with Bidithal? That is the most brutal, simplistic answer to the problem of Bidithal. Right. Um, it's it's uh, eye for an eye, or even worse, I guess, kind of well, morality. It's yeah. you have this poetic death for Bidithal. Yeah, um, he has his uh, 
uh, genitalia ripped off, not cut off, not circle, ripped off and right. stuffed down his throat. Yep. It is the like absolutely brutal. And we as reader are looking at this. And you know what? You find satisfaction because Bidithal was evil. What he was doing was evil. The novel has shown us what he did was evil. We have seen the repercussions of what he did on Felicin the Younger. Yep. Female genital mutilation is absolutely horrendous. Bidithal yep. doing this is absolutely horrendous. And we celebrate Carsa doing this. And you then have that moment yep. of, are we the barbarian then? What exactly. happened? What exactly. happened to us, the civilized person, the modern day person? Yep. Going, oh no, these com these simple simplistic answers, these we need more nuance, we need more complexity. Right. We we have that within ourselves. And Erickson shows us that. He doesn't mock the reader. He no, doesn't dictate no. to the reader. He shows us this. Yep. Yeah, and I will admit. Us. I will admit that uh, part of me was rooting for Carsa in that scene, um, and I also admit that I was reflecting on that. Oh, wait, wait. am I? Is there a little Carsa in me? I guess. Uh, but, <laughs> so, you know, the, the the entire Bidithal storyline, um, I think, is is so well done because. Yeah. Uh, we look at the complexity of this alliance in the whirlwind camp and yeah. you have all of these different factions and they banded together because they want to defeat the Molasses. Right. And then they all know what Bidithal is doing. And you go, well, why don't you stop them? Why don't, why don't you stop him? And it's, well, we need Bidithal for this. Well, I, I, I need to get myself into a position where I can do that. Well, I will do something about it when it's slightly more convenient. Well, once this has been done, then I can do it. Right. And we look at these people and you go, how could you let this go on? And then it occurs to you, how many countries are our societies allied with where this goes on? What, right. why, don't, why don't we step in to stop this in our world? Well, well the thing is we, we're building a military base there. So, uh, you know, once we've gotten all that sorted out and we've done that, then we'll deal with it. Yeah. Well, the, the the area is geopolitically a little unstable. We need we need an ally in the area, and and he's the best ally. So we'll kind of forgive that because we're trying to defeat a a, a greater evil. The, right. It's a utilitarian principle here that right. we need. Right. Well, the, the thing is, we're we're mining in that area, and we need in this world we find every excuse not to see it not to deal with it yes and what carsa shows us is is this convenient no is it the right thing to do yes yeah yeah so it's, it's really interesting um and his development is is really well done that arc that uh very flawed character who gets some epiphanies along the way and i love the interactions with Tor i love it when carsa says to torval too many words you know <laughs> <laughs> but it's those words that are helping to transform him and maybe he's resisting that transformation but like even when he is chained and bound yeah. and he admits torvald's constant talking was Bacon. the only thing keeping him even fractionally sane yep and that's the thing carsa for carsa to change he had to have his entire world broken and we cannot afford to you do that space. yeah I mean, but we can't it, afford it. to do that to our world right so how do we learn this lesson yeah we, we we see it we see these different experiences um and that's what ericsson i think constantly shows us particularly with carsa's storyline yeah. he yeah. shows us all of these difficult issues and asks us to think about it. Yep. Um, sure. And I think even like Torvald, like remember, he's not a good guy either. Right. He's he's a thief, he's a robber, he's a murderer. Yeah. Um, and yet you go, oh yeah, but he's kind of funny. <laughs> oh yes, that roguish murderer. 
that, you know, oh, he's a great character. And you go, well, in comparison to Carsa, yeah, he is kind of likable. Well, and yeah. You go, <laughs> a bit of a, a relative comparison here. Like, yeah. It's, it's all about, we object to certain things. But yeah, him being a murderer, that's all fine. We can forgive him that because we didn't see him murder people. Right. Carsa um, chopping the slave owner to pieces and then carrying the body. Yeah. To still alive. Oh, yeah, because you know, I, I, I want you to suffer. Right. And I don't know about you, but when that happened, you don't, in, well, I didn't, and maybe this is because I'm a bad person, but I didn't immediately react with, oh, that is absolutely horrendous. I was like, mm -hmm. mm, is it justified? Mm, is it a bit harsh? Mm. You know, yeah. we see this because we have seen and experienced Carse's slavery, because right. we have seen and experienced the torture, because we have seen and experienced the betrayal. Right we get a sense of Carse's rage. We understand the need of vengeance, how good vengeance can feel, the lure of vengeance and right. lashing out. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting because the slave master had just previously uh, threatened to do the same to Carsa when he had the shackles on him. He was saying, yeah, yeah I'm going to make you lose your arm, your hands and your, I'm going to enjoy it. And so Carsa it's an, again, that eye for eye kind of morality, um, which is, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 these are books are, are, are here to make us think, that's for sure. So uh, is there anything else on Carsa before we move on? Because we do have a whole bunch of other characters to discuss. Well, uh, the, the last sort of aspect specific about Carsa was um, the, the transition that we have, where he ends up and, and where he was at the beginning. And we see it when He's confronted by the seven fake Tiblor gods, the, the right. seven Imas. Yep. And he cuts one down. And of course, the others escape. But he picks up her remains and right. speaks to her. And of course, these are gods that have tortured the, the, the Tiblor. Yeah, they, they manipulated have them. Manipulated them, yeah. Manipulated them. Manipulated him. And yep. for someone as arrogant as he was at the beginning, who is so <laughs> brutal, that his his reaction we think well he's just going to destroy her and she says that she wants oblivion but he carries her with him right and then at the end we have that moment when he puts her remains into the water so she can dissolve and have oblivion an act of mercy yeah this act of mercy which is so unexpected when carsa kills bitithal vengeance we get that an yeah. act of mercy. Mm. And so it challenges our assumptions about can a person change? Can a person become a better person? Can yes. a person be forgiven? Should they be forgiven? What yes. is necessary for forgiveness? Yeah. Um, because Erickson doesn't say ever, you have to forgive Carsa. He doesn't say Carsa has earned your forgiveness. He asks the question, can Carsa ever be forgiven? Right, right. And he isn't asking us to immediately come up with an answer because this is an open-ended question. And again, it, it's for our own world. Can we forgive people who have done despicable acts, yeah. unforgivable acts? Can right. they change? It's, it's a plea to consider it. Yeah. Um, so I, I just think that was a point about Carsa that I think is, is always useful to bring up because it's not forgive him. Oh, he's great now. He's a hero. It's right. no, 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 there's complexity. Uh, it's morally gray. Everyone is made up of darkness and light in different quantities, in different mixtures. Yep. And we have to acknowledge we are all deeply flawed people. Yeah. This is a real world 
debate as well. We, we talk about incarceration and prison reform and, and stuff like that. And the way we view justice is evolving, I think, to some degree in the world. So that is uh, definitely a, a real world issue as well. And it's, it's very complex. And again, like the point I made earlier, that fantasy is a lens, a way of dealing with these deeply emotive, deeply personal, difficult questions and seeing them explored in fantasy yeah. is a way to explore them that removes that immediacy, that removes part of that emotional reaction. Because yeah. we all know if someone hurt one of our loved ones, right? the rage you would feel, yep. you are not in a position mm -mm to think clearly about it, which is one of the reasons, you know, why juries are not made up of a victim's family. Right, right. But it's not to say you shouldn't feel that. It's to help us all explore it and think through it and think through the ramifications and Absolutely. to do it in a way that's safe, to do it in a way that's protected, to do it in a way that protects our brains, our psyche, our, our hearts, our feelings that we can explore it and, and think about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's magnificent. That's what literature can do. Well, we have some other characters to talk about. And I'm very curious about this duo that you have alluded to. Uh, there are some great ones in here. I, we mentioned Torvald and Karsa for a period. They're there. And then Karsa later uh, is with Leoman of the Flails. And um, there are some wonderful moments with Onrak and, uh, and uh, Troll, and so we got to talk about all those, but the one I think that you were going to talk about, I have a feeling it has something to do with Pearl and Lostara Yil, am I correct? Yeah, now this is something that Erickson has spoken about in interviews, that okay. some of the exchanges between Pearl and Lestara Yill are almost word for word exchanges that he has had with his wife. <laughs> so okay. that, that brilliant exchange where they are, um, they see the dragon that is uh, being, is basically cr in cruciform, is nailed to the, the frame. Yeah. And they're drifting down. And it's, well, what's going on? Oh, well, it's this, you don't know what's happening. You're just making that up. And it's, well, it's creative conjecture. Why can't you say you just don't know? And then about five lines later. I don't know. What, what is this thing? Well, I don't know. Well, couldn't you come up with something better? <laughs> and it's, I'm reading this. And this is one of the things that Erickson works in is so much of the dialogue reads as real because yeah. we can imagine a lot of these conversations. When yeah. we hear or see the Marines talking, when we see the soldiers talking and there's that banter, there's that um, edge to it. The fact that sometimes they don't answer the question they are asked and you go, yes, that's how we all talk. Yeah. If you ever record a conversation between you and your friends and you right. play it back and you go, hang on, I asked him, what is your favorite color? And he was saying, I think we should have fish. You go, what? None of this makes any sense. And then you think back to the conversation and you go, yeah, but Previously, we've been talking about what we were going to have for dinner. He said, right. I'm thinking of having the fish. And a couple of seconds later, he said his favorite color was blue. But it's, we don't think in uh, question response. That's a very right. unnatural way to do a conversation. And True. Erickson has this natural stuff worked in where yeah. there's just, it flows. The dialogue is great. It is definitely among many strengths in here. I just, I love the dialogue and there are some great, comical moments in the dialogue as well. We mentioned Onrak and Troll Sengar. And there's that moment when uh, Onrak decides that he's going to free the, the Derogoth. I don't know if he does it on purpose or what, but he hits this, He it's, it's illustrated on your, your uh, edition of the book on the cover there, but uh, I think that's what that is. And, and he frees the Derek off and one of them grabs him and just shakes him around. And then finally, and he's a mess and throws him. And then I love the part afterwards when Troll kind of goes up to him and, and asks to, see if, to see if he's alive or all right or whatever. Well, undead. Undead still. Uh, and he says, uh, so much for gratitude. <laughs> but again, we've seen, 
we've seen the emas with that dry desiccated sense of humor exactly but what i love here was the the uh, sort of visual metaphor of the dog shaking the bone he's a mass <laughs> of bones and the dog is just shaking at this bone that he's got and you yeah. go what did you think was going to happen he's a big dog and there's a bone in front of him right right boy they just needed to play fetch and it would be complete um it's, I, i'm absolutely convinced that one of these days steve's going to write a scene where um there's the hounds of shadow or something and you know it's they, they just want a bit of love and cuddle some to tickle their belly yeah they belly they love belly rubs i'm sure just like all dogs <laughs> but they're a great pair i i love them and it, it's interesting to see those two evolve in each other's presence as well of course initially onrak doesn't he doesn't seem to even care you have this poor guy who's it was actually tied up and he's he's going to die and he's had this horrible ritual done and he's bleeding on his forehead and all that and he's about to drown because the water is coming up and um onrak initially just gonna walk by you know and it evolves from that to the point by the time you get to the end with these two it's like troll is crying at one point because onrak can't cry right because he's learned about the death of his his former spouse and all that it's it just it's beautiful the way this this relationship evolves and we go on this journey with them um and well obviously we need to come back to this point because it, it ties into the whole story that's going on and, and it yes. fills in details but yeah. with with onrak and, and troll remember that onrak because he, he is, is sundered from the vi right uh, the ritual and right. now is apart from it right. and then it's a new vi a new ritual is created between him and troll correct and it's this amazing new experience for onrak because he didn't realize how much of how he perceived the world how much he felt how much he thought was conditioned upon the thing that defines his society right have we discussed this before? Perhaps. Um, so we see it in a completely different light here. We see Troll, who has seen something in a different way to his society, and yeah. he is cast out. Onrak is threatened by the other Imas who go, no, we're going to destroy you because you're no right. longer part of the ritual. They right. are pursuing Imas, whose crime it was to feel. Not that they betrayed anyone, they right. failed. And because right. of that, they are now outcast. That yeah. we see all of these aspects about different societies, different beliefs, different things that that society is absolutely convinced this is the right thing because they cannot see it from a different perspective. Interesting. That's what's being explained. And we see it with all of these different characters. It's yeah. Kars's arc. It's Troll and Onrak's arc. Yeah. It's... Um, even Lestara, Yill, and Pearl. Think mm -hmm. of the revelations they go through. Right. Um, Crocus becoming, uh, developing into an assassin called Cutter and right. his relationship with Sari and how Sari and he are trying to negotiate this new reality because they are now outside of what they ever knew and right. they're trying to find a way for themselves. Look yep. at the Teast Andy on the island who live completely differently to the Andy of Moonspot. Yes. So many different ways of being broken in here too. Uh, and the brokenness and the links between many of these broken characters and, and the, the, the crippled God, which is they're, they're implied to be this house of chains. This is the name of the book, right? This is what that is forming, this house of chains the basis of it seems to be brokenness in in some ways i feel like this is a very important theme here um so um yeah, yeah i mean it, it, it it's really interesting and how characters who have suffered brokenness like troll and onrak who have been broken away from their societies find solace in one another find understanding in one another and these are these wonderful moments of connection that I just love in, in this series. Um, and this then obviously brings us to what is the conclusion of Felison's arc, this ah. tragic 
absolutely heartrending, tragic end to Fellison's yeah. story. Yeah. And, but we also see it as one of the foundational starting points of Tavor's story. Erickson yeah. plays with the cyclical notion, but right. we, have, we have suffered along with Fellison. We have seen what she has suffered. We have seen what she has gone through. And yeah. at the end of Dead House Gates, there was this moment where she reaches an accord with uh, Drinja. Oh. Drijna. Drijna. Yeah. yeah. Um, she reaches an accord with Drijna. You're not going to possess me. We'll work in partnership. And right. we see this as the, uh, because of the death of Bowdoin, because right. Felicent's armor that she had plated herself in to try and protect herself has broken apart. That this was a moment where maybe she could have healed. Yeah. Or maybe, not that she would, it's not that all of this is going to be wiped clean, but she could move forward and grow and the scars would be there, but she yeah. had a future. And over the course of this book, we see that Drishna insidiously takes over. Yeah. And does it incrementally so that Fellison does not realize right. that slowly she is being stripped away. And right. then we have that moment when she walks into Hiboric's tent. The wards keep Drishna out. Yep, and she thinks of Felicin, her daughter. And she immediately thinks of Felicin the Younger, her adopted daughter, this, this girl that she adopted, that she cares for, that she loves, that we know, we as readers know what has happened to her. Right. It, it, it rips your heart out because you see, there's Felicin, this character who'd become colder and we were going, what is wrong with her? Why is she like this? Right. And we see it's this supernatural being possessing her, has stripped her of that humanity, has stripped her of everything she was entitled to. Yep. To brutally enact vengeance and revenge. And we see Felicin in that moment, and we realize, oh, she could, have, she steps out and Drishna takes over again. Right. And it's and ripped away. Yep, it's, it's hard. And there's a representation of generational trauma there as well with what happens to Felicin the younger. And, and of course, um, uh, the older Felicin who is <laughs> Shaikh now, um, not, being able to recall her human self because in the very first place she was trying in a way by adopting Felis and Younger she was trying to save herself really and um, it's a it's a it's a very tragic thing and of course it all concludes in I think one of the most tough tragedies here with the the scene with Felis and, and, and Tavor we have to talk about that but Tavor is a character who really gets developed in here and I really um, we never get her POV but it's fascinating how effectively Steven Erickson makes me feel for this character through other characters, such as Gamut. You know, he's a bit of a father figure to her and he's obviously very concerned for her and the relationship between those two. And then later on at the very end, when Lostara Yil witnesses, she's one of the few who knows who Shaikh is. And the she's not known to be a, a extremely you know, uh, emotional character, Lost Star. But when she sees that scene, it's like you can see that she's she's very affected by it. And and it's through all these other characters that we're getting these glimpses of this this interesting character, Tavor. And right? and of course, structurally, this Tavor that we see is very similar to Coltian, the, yeah. the the war leader. And it's it's a very deliberate mirror because. You know, yeah. she's following the reverse path of the chain of dogs. Exactly. Erickson keeps bringing us these images that Tavor Coltin, Tavor Coltin. He has right. soldiers remark on it. And again, the soldiers at the beginning doubt. The soldiers are cynics. The soldiers do not believe. And no matter right. what happens along the way, just like Duiker in Dead House Gates, right. they keep winning. They, but no, obviously it is not the same. But right. Tavor does what she set out to do. She commands, yeah. she has these plans. She doesn't explain them. 
Yeah. And people are like, oh, that's that's absolutely terrible. You go, but that's what Coltian did. Yeah. Coltian didn't reveal his plans to anyone. That's why we had Duiker's perspective. Right. Um, where he was such a cynic at the beginning, and in the end, he believed. We have exactly that same journey here. And yet, in the end, if you think about it from Tavor's perspective, this yeah. should be a fanfare. This should be a triumph. This is they have killed Shaikh, the whirlwind. The, the rebellion will be crushed. Yeah. And just like in Dead House Gates, the rug is pulled out from under us, but in this way, in an entirely different way. Yeah. And we see this moment. And because it's even worse because we get it from Fallison's perspective. Exactly. Because suddenly she's freed of Drishna. She, yeah. She's no longer possessed. She's starting to come back to herself. And right. she looks up and she sees her sister. And yeah, she is flooded with those emotions of my sister betrayed me. And she's all this is going through her head. But before she can do anything, before she can say anything, yep. Tavor runs her through. Yep. And what's the last thing that she thinks? Why didn't you love me? Right. I just wanted you to love me. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that is really <laughs> that is so powerful. And, and, and go ahead. And what what I th think about here is, Bellison dies in the most tragic way, killed yeah. by her own sister. This is that sort of Greek tragedy played out. But not yep. only that, she dies not knowing that her sister had had a plan in place to save her. Her sister had been yeah. trying to orchestrate everything to save her life. Because yeah. if she'd stayed in the capital, she would have been killed in the cull. Yeah. This was the only thing out of all of the bad options that Tavor had. This was her only option. And then an entire continent-wide rebellion starts up and she couldn't get to her sister. Right. And now she finally gets to her sister. And what does she do? Kills her. Kills her. Yeah, and, and ignorance, of course. Um, and but it, it is like, go ahead. Sorry, I was just say, like, if you were Pearl and Lestari Yell, yeah, would you be sauntering over there to go? Oh, by the way, you know, you told us to find your sister. She's over there. Oops. And, yeah. No. Yeah. Even Pearl, who I don't think is a very uh, <laughs> typically merciful character. <laughs> commits a, a, a wonderful act of mercy in bringing the body away as quickly as possible so that Tavor cannot know ever that that was her sister. And the dialogue that is so fraught with irony when she asked, did you find her? And, 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 and Pearl compassionately says, uh, alas, she, she's dead. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it's really, it, it's like it, those moments in, like you said, Greek tragedy, like an Oedipus, where there's this irony here that's very present and, as well. And even then, when they say, but we can tell you she died quickly. Quickly, yeah, yeah. To give Tavor that modicum of compassion and to right. hold back the fact you've just killed, because if, if that was revealed to her. Like, oh yeah. Like, I, I cannot even imagine what someone would do in that situation. Would yeah. they? kill you like shoot the messenger would they be destroyed and break what like right. how would you handle that so i i honestly i don't think lestari yell or pearl could have done anything other than do not tell her right. Jesus right. Me. Right. um interesting and tavor's evolution through the whole thing is very interesting there's that moment early on when the uh, grub comes and they're trying to get the army to, you know, to form up and it's a mess and, and they're finally making some progress because of Fiddler and the other um, veterans who, uh, the sapper, you know, uh, who brings the, uh, uh, gosh, and, and gets everybody's attention. I mean, it's a great thing. But then of course, Grub comes along with this thigh bone and everybody's like, oh no, we're done. You know, it's, it's this omen and it's, there's a sense of doom. And I love, first of all, what the veterans do with that is they embrace it, they make it their own and they give the little finger bones to everybody. But Tavor has the savvy, she has the, um, the wisdom 
to also see what they're doing, understand what they're doing and embrace it as well in her own subtle way. And I, I just, it, it's really cool to see her evolve that way. But it was that moment where, because they were all like, some of them had as a necklace, some of them, and she went, no, no, it should be hanging there on the right. You're out of uniform. Make sure you get that fixed up. Oh, and Renault, yeah. yeah. And it, it's not, she doesn't make a big deal out of it. She just exactly. goes, yes, of course. And that is, a, again, one of these, I love the way that these signals are worked into the text, that we should respect her intelligence. She is so smart. She knows what she's doing. Yeah. She knows that here's this army that has been listening to, to all of these stories about the death of Coltane, the whole chain of dogs. They right. are not, they are not in good shape to begin with. Right. Then there's this whole omen thing. And it's like, what are we going to do? And it's rely on the veterans. The veterans have the experience. They know what right. they're doing. Yep. Um, and we also have, and again, this is something that I, I think gets glossed over in a lot of Ericsson's work. The absolute acceptance of everyone that Tavor is a lesbian. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's actually, it's I would have to say there are times when when Erickson steps in with almost like an authorial note. And it kind of ruins the suspension of disbelief because he has someone comment on it. He has someone point out, doesn't she know that no one cares? I think is the line. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I you go. That. It, it strikes a slightly discordant note because, right. but if no one cares, why would you mention it? Within but, that world, yeah. But I think it's one of these things that every once in a while, Erickson is trying to give us a nudge because everyone complains. Like, he doesn't tell us enough. He doesn't give us this. He doesn't. And you go, oh. and when he does, we ignore it. And so <laughs> um, he has the same thing. He has, I think it's uh, sorry and... Uh, sorry, Absalar and Cutter and uh, Magora. And Magora says, why should you expect me to cook for you just because I'm a woman? Right. And you go, in a, a feminist reality, the, the majority of the world, this world is constructed as feminist. Yes. Uh, or gender equal at the very least. So our um, world intruded there in that scene a little bit. Yeah. And the real world, the real world intrudes because Erickson has to give us this signal of going, Have you, did you spot it yet? Yeah, because and I think this is because it goes back to when the, the first couple of books were coming out. No one had commented on this. Now, obviously, yeah. you know, looking at it now, um, we've seen interviews with him. I, yeah. I, I did a video on it trying to explain the rationale. And that was an academic paper I did something like 15 years ago. Yeah, because people weren't picking up on that aspect. But yeah. um, we have these wonderful for. Uh, for an epic fantasy series, a military fantasy series, a series that has adventure fantasy, barbarian fantasy, it has all of these elements. And you go, it's gender neutral, it's um, queer friendly, yeah. it's post-colonial because yeah. very few people in this world are white. Almost no one is. Right, right. It, it is this wonderful world where it goes, no, this is the accepted norm but we're still going to look at the darkness of humanity because those things aren't what cause darkness. Let, yes. Let's look at this. Yeah, it's great. And, and just to, you know, go back to Tavor for a bit and we probably have a bunch of other characters we need to talk about, but it, it's amazing too. To, it, you can easily forget how young this woman is. She is not that old and she has had all these burdens placed upon her. Uh, and that is something that you feel almost palpably through the other characters once again, you know, and it's just so well done. And her, it's going to be really interesting to watch this character. Um, fascinating and really well developed in here. And again, he does it without, for a single moment, making her a POV character. I think it's just, it's really cool. And, and that's, uh, again, this, this whole, we keep saying, show, don't tell. This is what he does. It, it, and we see all of these moments and it's up to us to, to try and fill them, to try and interpret them, to try and put them together. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that Erickson put in, particularly with the, with the army, the scorpion scene. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is one of my favorite scenes from the entire 10 book series. It's brilliant. It's funny. Um, and not only is it this brilliant moment of humor of the sort of the, the dumb games that um, 
people play when they're trapped out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, so like down on the beach and, you know, as a little kid and, you know, you've, you've got your bucket and spade and you find these little crabs in rock pools. So you put them in an arena. Of course, the crab just walks away. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's these dumb games that we do to amuse ourselves. Yeah. And you can, you can so easily imagine these, these soldiers out there going, yep, this is the new squad game that we're going to do. Right. And it, it makes it feel so real. Now, so I, I talk about it in terms of authenticity, of verisimilitude, um, because you can't call it realistic because one of the scorpions basically splits in two. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a symbiote. Now, there are things in our world, in right. this reality, that have these sorts of relationships, but nothing quite like this. And right. so for me, it's one of these things that creates both uh, an awesome sense of uh, this world existing, verisimilitude, truthness, uh, truthiness, to, truthiness to the yeah. world, a truthfulness to the world, but at the same time emphasizing its secondary world fantasy nature because two scorpions. Yeah. And it's so unexpected. You can see the other sergeants are just going, you, you knew that from the, are you cheating? Not only did they cheat, but they even hinted at it with the name of the bird shit scorpion. What was it? Something union. I forget. <laughs> Joyful oh. union. Joyful union. I mean, it's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they kind of rubbed their noses in the fact that they got them. And that's it. And they, they all knew from the start. He went, you guys are up to something. I said, what? Yeah. And then it's, go and inspect them. And everyone's inspected. They go through the whole thing. They swear the vows. Yeah. And he yeah. goes, we're rich men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. Um, yeah, the interactions between the veterans and, and the, uh, the newer recruits too. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. And then you have the whole ascendancy of the bridge burners as well, which is pretty cool stuff in there. I mean, the, the ending of this is, uh, I'm beginning to see uh, a, a pattern here with the ending of these books being in one form or another, absolute, just all these things coming together brilliantly and having all of this, you know, explode and, and you're trying to figure out what's going on and left and right. And it just, the, the last couple hundred pages of every single one of these books just flashes by for me. I don't I, I, if that's true for you, but. Um, well, this is where I know, I know that a lot of people find the first half or the first two thirds of the book. They, uh, the, the phrase I keep hearing is, oh, it was such a slog. Or, you know, I only liked that story and I didn't like the rest. And then almost invariably, and I, I won't say for everyone, but a lot of the time people go, oh, the last 100 pages or the last 200 pages were absolutely mind blowing. Right. And the thing is you go, this is the fourth book. Like, didn't you notice this in the first three? <laughs> Stop yeah. thinking. And again, you know, everyone is entitled to their, to their own opinion and everyone's entitled to express their opinion on what they're feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. Right. But what I'd suggest is stop thinking about it as a slog. This, this is not about getting to that point. That right. Look at those starting points and go, what is going on? Like you, yeah. I've done prologue analysis videos where I spend 15, 20, 40 minutes on yes. only a few paragraphs. And yeah, you, go, you have. That, uh, yeah, but well, I, I can spend that amount of time talking about anything, really. <laughs> it, it's not, it's a curse, but. A blessing <laughs> for all of us. But what we have here is we, we still seem to fall into this thing of, I want the action. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was something I was trying to explain, I think, with, with Dead House Gates, that right. the journey is necessary to set this up. Dead yeah. House Gates would not have the emotional impact if you kind of went, yeah, they walked along, they lost, lost a bunch of people and then died within sight of Aaron. You go, oh yeah, that's terrible, moving on. Whereas right. Dead House Gates gives you a kick right in the fields. Yeah. Memories of ice. Oh, well, you know, why didn't they just do this thing and they could have gotten there faster? I had to slog through all this, but you go, where would the emotional impact have been if you had not been with Ekovian to get to know him? Yeah. Oh, I want, I want a, a small core cast of characters that I can follow through these things. And you go, okay, here's Ekovian. Yeah, but it was kind of boring. <laughs> you... And I, I completely, everyone reads 
in very different ways and everyone focuses on different things. People like or dislike different aspects of each of the books. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think most of the time we can agree that if you trust in Ericsson, right. and this is not going, oh, worship at the altar of Ericsson, but if you trust in what he, he knows he's doing, he keeps developing these stories that, you know, oh, these are a slow burn, but he's laying out all of the pieces. Think of it right. as a chessboard. He's setting up the entire gambit so that it gets to a point where suddenly it goes click, 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 checkmate, you're done. Yeah. That everything gets set up beforehand. But take your time, enjoy that buildup because yeah. suddenly the dominoes are going to start falling and other mixed metaphors are going to be used to describe this. And, and it's, it's really brilliant too because. <laughs> you don't think it's going to happen the way it happens either. Like who, okay, who honestly would have predicted that the battle scene that this is all building up to doesn't actually happen the way you think it's going to happen. And that the, actually what happens is the, the uh, Rarakou or however you say the name, the desert, it raises this army of the dead or the ghosts or whatever. And the bridge burners are all wrapped into this because of the song, the, the Tano spirit walker song. And, and the Wiccans and the, the Wiccans, Wiccans who were murdered and yeah. all of the chain of dogs who had been murdered by these bastards in the trenches. The dog slayers. Yeah. And that all happens and you think, oh, that is not what I expected. And then the, the confrontation, in a, in a way, I really love that because you've eliminated the big epic conflict in order to have this very focused conflict between these two sisters instead. And I think it's just so emotionally impactful and poignant. I, I just love the way he's done this. And, and yet at the same time, we still have that fulfillment of epic yeah. battle, of yep. brilliant action. That it's yep. not just, oh, uh, it, it's just this duel, this, this very short fight. It, it's not that. We still have all of these moments. We yes. still have this buildup. It's just done in a different way. Yeah. Um, and it is something that, you know, they both Ericsson and Esselman talk about convergence. Yeah. Uh, within narrative theory, as you well know, we talk about closure, uh, where uh, you achieve closure at the end of a narrative. And if a narrative has good closure, that's the feeling you have at the end of the book. And you can still have a couple of dangling threads that are left to develop later. Like, this is all worked in. We've seen it happen the first three times. It's going to happen again here. And right. one of the things, um, I, I, I have heard this as a complaint about uh, Memories of Ice. The complaint that um, why do uh, the bridge burners run ahead to Coral? Right. And right. why don't they? Why, that's a really dumb thing to do, and it leads to them all dying. Now, look at the Whirlwind's camp. That is an alliance made up of these different factions. Right. And what, what happens? they end up basically slaughtering each other because yeah. it's not just about beating the Malazans. It's about what do you do the day after you beat right. the Malazans? Right. So That's then the think back yep. to Memories of Ice and you have yeah. Caledon Brood uh -huh. and, and you have uh, and Anamander and Rick, Rick. Yep. who a couple of months ago had been slaughtering Malazans. Right. And now they're allied with the Malazans going, this is a bad guy that we need to defeat. And you go, right, right okay. And what are you going to do immediately after defeating him? Because the Malazans <laughs> want the city and they know the fleet is on the way there with an occupying army. Right. Because as soon as the Pani and Doman is defeated, the Malazans are going to start their, their conquest again. Right. And who right. are their enemies going to be? Brood and Rick and that whole army. Yeah. So it's important to get there first. And yeah. you go, yeah, but they're going to get slaughtered. And the empire goes, yes, we know. Yep. We are willing to spend their lives to give us this strategic advantage. Yep. Because after the, the common, after the common enemy is gone, you're either going to have an, an awkward conversation or you're going to have a bloodbath. So. And that's look at the race to Berlin in World War II. There you go. The, the, the Russians and the Western allies coming in, in in both directions. Yep. That is exactly what's happening here. The need to occupy the city. And they yeah. race in together to try and get there first. That's yeah. what we had here because the Malazans are looking, after, looking at what happens after we take Coral. Right. 
Right, right. And is it going to cost them all their lives? Yeah, but they go, but that's why we're soldiers. This is our job. Yeah. The yeah. empire gets to decide how it spends our lives. That's how brutal it is. Yeah. Um, so people going, oh, but this was a strategic dumb thing to do. And you go, yeah, it was in the sense that if all of the combined forces had arrived at the same time and done the same thing, it would have been much right. easier to do that. But then you could have had an all out bloodbath right. from the different sides deciding who's going to conquer Coral, who's going to so occupy small, it. Small picture, it looks stupid. Big picture, it's, it's brilliant strategy. Yeah. Well, not as a brilliant, but understandable. Right, right. Or maybe a necessity. <laughs> so great. Well, um, who else do we need to talk about? Who have we neglected thus far? Well, we haven't really spoken about um, Cutter and Absalar and their meeting with uh, Cotillion. Oh, Cotillion is something else in this. Yeah. And of course, the Drift of Ali and all that too. Yeah. Good um, stuff there. And yeah. I mean, there's, there's some that particular sequence. I know that that Cutter and Absalar's story thread here is is a little underdeveloped, but we can see is this this thread that's winding all the way through connecting these books for us that we yeah. still have these these characters around. But we've heard so much about Cotillion. Yeah, we've we've seen how he's feared. We saw how awesome Kalam was right. when he was doing this stuff, and now we actually see Cotillion in action, and right. it it is just jaw-dropping you just go okay yeah i yeah, thought kalam was a badass he scared kalam kalam was like oh uh, okay yeah you're right in that scene near the end um and that's now we know why yeah but also i mean there's uh, i i will do a, like a separate video on this because i want to talk about the characterization particularly of cotillion and shadow throne in what is it chapter 16. Oh, uh, cool. really cool analysis but a bit long to go into now because we are running very late, Philip. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but uh, I think seeing Cotillion in action, seeing Darist in action, seeing yeah. these, these different people um, and suddenly understanding even the, the levels of threat in the world are not mm -hmm. what we thought. Right. Seeing the development of the House of Chains, mm -hmm. the repercussions of the master of the deck being there, and right. now this new house coming out, and now the crippled god is going to have to play by the rules of right. everyone else. He can't yeah. be outside the system kicking the board over. He's now on the board with everyone else. So exactly. there's this is... I, almost every time with almost every book you can say this is the first book that is introducing this thing every single book so far has been well this is the first book that we're really introducing this and this is the first book that we're really introducing the house of chains yeah 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 it's interesting but you you do get some insights into a lot of the the backstories with with darist or andarist who is Anamander, Anamander's uh younger brother uh, even though he looks older um and what exactly were they doing there they were protecting the throne of shadow and so you have all this vying for power not only do you have this new house of chains coming out but you have the the throne of shadow you also have the other throne that uh toward the end you have onrak and troll and the other uh Tlanimas racing to protect and of course you meet up with some familiar faces there as well as they're all trying to protect this from the imminent invasion um the i uh, what what throne is that that's the the uh the, the first throne the first throne okay so you've read paths to ascendancy you should know I this have. i have i just I had a little slip there but yeah i have yeah so the first throne that's important because obviously as the clan mass explain uh, that would give somebody control over the clan of mass and they could do some very nasty things uh, there. And it's interesting too, we learned that Kellenved was a, a relatively, um, let's say, uh, conservative in his use of the clan of mass, according to uh, the clan of mass himself. So, um, um, yeah, and it, again, we, we keep getting these different perspectives of people. If you think how Lucene was initially portrayed, 
yeah. how we we see Lucine in in different books, how Kalimved was portrayed and referred to, how right. we see Shadow Throne portrayed and referred to. Right. Every time we get a different perspective, we realize that who people are is shaped by all of these external perceptions of them and that information being transmitted to us and then we're interpreting that and going right i know who that person is and you go well have you looked at them from 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 this angle over here now have you looked at them from this angle over here right is that the same and and again it's erickson does not go this is who this person is it's i'm going to keep showing you things what you do, what you do with that information or what you don't do with that information is right. up to you. I trust you as the reader. Here's the information. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he does that really well with Cotillion, for example, and, and how here you have this, I mean, he is, first of all, awesome and scary in parts in this book, but he's also incredibly compassionate in his interactions with Absalar and with Cutter. But and, remember, you have to contrast that. Yeah. Why did Absalar end up the way that she did? Right. Right. You know, it's again, we see these different aspects of Cotillion. Yeah. We see we see him express regret. Yeah. For what he did to Sorry. And you right. almost think, is that why she got the name Sorry? Huh. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's absolutely fine because we've seen Iskral past and we've seen the cackling of Shadow Throne. I mean, you go, oh yeah. And then in, in that sequence in uh, chapter 16, we see Shadow Throne in a slightly different light. Yeah, yeah. And um, we see um, Tavor from all these different angles. And then f- the, that shot that we see her from Felicent's perspective is yeah. again, so emotionally charged and different. We yeah. keep seeing these, these people from different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, and, and glimpses of some very interesting characters, that Traveler character, for example, really cool. Uh, but so. I think I think we, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the shadow demons from the diamonds. Yeah. That yeah. what happens when he lifts his, his arm up? Two penises drop out and his his urine sets fire to the tent. Yeah, yeah, that's a moment. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, in the middle of this epic fantasy with these high emotions and all of this high drama, right? we have a shadow demon with two penis, penises, peni, two peni, (laughs) (laughs) and and flammable urine. You go, what? What the hell is good? What am I reading? Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, and that all comes together somehow or other in in this ending that it just you can't stop turning those pages. So uh, it's brilliant stuff. Well, to be perfectly honest, Philip, I it is actually it's getting quite late for me here. I know. Yeah. I, I I have had an absolute blast. Are there any sort of like key points and uh, things that we we have not discussed that you really you you think that we have to? You know, I'm going to think of all of them five minutes after we stop. Well, in in that case, okay. um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. It is always an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I love having these discussions with you. I really do appreciate it, Philip. Oh, it, it's uh, like I've always said, it's mutual. I, I feel like I am on this second read of this series getting to know these books in a way that I, I just could not be happier because I loved the books the first time, I had huge respect for them, but I feel so much more emotionally connected to them now. And I feel like I'm understanding them a lot more. And it's because of these conversations with you, quite frankly, I find them so enriching. And I hope that our viewers are going to, uh, you know, uh, appreciate some of these points too, because I certainly do. I love listening to you. <laughs> Well, if our viewers are anything like the undergraduates I used to teach, half of them are asleep by now, and the other <laughs> half didn't show up in the first place. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of sleep, you're, you're uh, going to need to hit the pillow pretty soon. So okay. thank well, you so much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, take care. I will link to Philip's channel and the, the previous video in the description below. Uh, everyone who's still with us, thank you so much for watching. We really do appreciate it. Take care, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.